Kendra, uh, we talking dogs, we talking cats, we talking everybody. I think let's talk everybody. There's a couple of things that I, I would love to just bring up and, you know, probably people are like, wait, you're an oncologist, you treat cancer. Why are we talking about prevention here? But really, in my opinion, if we're talking about curing cancer, the really, the only cure is prevention. In my opinion, I think that, um, eventually conventional medicine will be able to turn cancer into a chronic disease, but to truly reverse it and cure it and make it go completely away and never exist, that's preventing it from happening in the first place. The other thing that I think is really important for pet parents to think about is kind of a springboard off of what you just mentioned. So <clears throat> conventional oncology treatment is um, tumor centric. Three patients with osteosarcoma, like you just said, get the same treatment. Integrative holistic therapy, three patients with osteosarcoma get three different treatments because cancer is not a foreign invader that has attacked the body and is taking over and needs to be cut, burned, and poisoned out of the body. Those are some treatments that we use to treat it, but it's the body cells which have gone rogue and along with sometimes needing the, the cutting, burning, and poisoning all the time need the metabolic support to try to correct those derangements that were there to begin with and fix all those underlying imbalances. So I think something else that's really important for owners to remember when they're thinking about cancer prevention is it's not something that happens out of nowhere that comes and attacks the body. There's very few, if any, cancers that are related to things like viruses and infections. And the other thing that was wildly eye-opening to me when I realized it was that in people, we don't have the same stats in animals, but I would imagine it would be very similar. In people, depending on the research paper that you look at, anywhere between 70 to 90% of cancers are preventable with lifestyle choices. So in humans, that would be things like smoking, alcohol consumption, obesity, dietary choices, um, sun exposure. So if only five to 10% of cancers are completely genetically driven, then that means the majority of cancer can be prevented by lifestyle choices. Yep. Now for animals, I do think that genetics and breeding specifically probably play a much larger role than it does in people because there's so much what's called line breeding. Right. Um, well, particularly if we look at Bernese mountain dogs, I mean, those are a good all example. All of those breeds, Bernese and flat coats and goldens and labs and boxers. We know time and time and time again, they come to us with cancers. And then there's other breeds that don't get it as often. So I think that what people need to understand is that there's so much we can do, especially on the holistic side with the metabolic supplement, um, you know, um, terrain of the body to keep it healthy, to prevent that from happening. And that's really powerful. Yep, exactly. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about, um, you know, some of the things like the, the, the very basics, the, the, the most important, I mean, we all know that I talk about food all the time. So I'm going to start there. I, I yeah. think that what we put, you know, crap in crap out and putting a clean diet in is really paramount to being the basis of anything else that we build on top of that. Absolutely. Yeah. And, um, that's what I always say to people. If there's only one thing that you can ever do, it's feed real food. Now, you know, optimal nutrition might be very different, um, from just a real food diet because, you know, unfortunately, and very sadly, the majority of the food that's readily available to most people is not very nutritious, meaning that 
Um, the animals um, that are supposed to be providing certain things for us are also heavily carbohydrate fed, pesticides, antibiotics, contaminated, um, the fruits and vegetables we eat, GMOs, pesticides, grown in soil that's been so depleted because of turnover of crops to have more food readily available, that that apple that's supposed to have however many milligrams of vitamin C doesn't because it can't get it from the ground anymore, um, from the tree it grows from. <clears throat> so I think very, unfortunately, even when people are trying to do their best to feed a healthy diet, the ingredients and in the food that they have access to may not have the same nutrition that they want it to. So it does come down to, um, I, you know, people always say, oh, like, are, are you a vegetarian? Are you a pescatarian? I always say everyone should be a qualitarian. You know, you do, <laughs> like the, <laughs> yeah, you do the best you can to get the highest quality products. And oftentimes that means you have to shift, especially in times of COVID where, you know, supply chains are so messed up. Um, you know, maybe sometimes that means you're eating wild caught fish. Maybe other times that means you're eating pasture raised beef. Maybe other times it's pasture raised poultry. So I think it's about, um, working with farms and farmers markets and CSAs to try to get the highest quality food possible at any time. Yeah, exactly. And that can be very difficult for people. I know, uh, we've been really proactive about that since we moved to North Carolina, we, our freezer is filled with pasture raised beef. We found, we actually found a farm where the wife is a veterinarian. She's not, oh my gosh, awesome. uh, cool. but they are really proactive about raising their cattle in a really healthy way and what they're fed because you have to look at what the animal that you're eating, what they ate. Absolutely. Um, so that was you know, a great find, but we did the same thing with our pork and with our poultry. And we happen to be in an area where within an hour's drive, we can find these farms that are raising the animals the way that we want. And then we had our own garden, which our soil is so depleted. We, the land that we bought was uh, a hay farm and wow. hadn't had anything added back into the soil for a long time. So uh, building up the soil in the garden is is one of our huge goals for the next year or two. Uh, but when you grow your own and you start with organic seeds and you're not using uh, pesticides and everything is done organically, uh, it makes a huge difference. And we got a freezer full of vegetables for the winter, which is awesome. Not everybody can do that. If you live in an apartment, if you're lucky, you'll have a pot of tomatoes on your patio. Um, so I, I get that it can be very difficult, but again, it's, it's the best you can do with the resources that you have available and the finances that you have available. I will tell you, it is definitely cheaper to grow your own veggies. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I've come across a couple of websites that I think are important because I think people automatically think, oh, and I hear this from my brothers all the time. Oh, it's too expensive. I can't eat organic. There are absolutely things that you can do to access organic, pasture-raised, et cetera, more affordably. So um, all the things that you mentioned obviously are awesome choices. There's a website called eatwild.com and consciouscarnivore.com. And they show you, you can put in your zip code and they show you all the local farms that will provide the meat, the dairy products, you know, all that, the cheeses, all the animal byproducts. Um, and frankly, if you're going to local farms, you're usually going to be paying, pay, oh, excuse me, paying less than you would be at any of the grocery stores. Um, yes. The other CSAs are always very good. You know, the, the um, community share agriculture in your area, and most places have that. Um, the other um, uh, websites that are good is uh, one is called uh, Misfits Market or Misfit Market. Okay. It's all like the ugly produce, like yeah. imperfections. There's nothing wrong with the food. It just looks bad. <laughs> and so th the grocery stores won't take it. So they sell it for significantly reduced costs. And there's a couple of those like that. So it's not impossible. And it's not, you can assume that if you're limited in finances, which you know almost all Americans are, that you can't afford it because there are ways around it. So there's definitely things to check out. And I like those three websites. Yeah, those are awesome. Thank you. Okay. So food is our foundation. We're going to start there. We're going to feed as healthy as we can. Yep. So uh, what things are we avoiding in order uh, yeah. to keep, keep our yeah. pets healthier? So um, 
I think the primary one that if we have a choice from a young age is that we're eliminating carbohydrates from the diet because they have no nutritional need for them. It's animals that have to restrict fat or protein that then have to have carbohydrates added to their diet to reduce the percentages of, um, of, uh, protein and fat, uh, the carbohydrates as all of us know as humans, if we eat too many carbs, it happens to us. They just convert to glucose and they affect your glycemic control They're If they're not utilized for energy, they're just stored as fat. And so, um, limiting our carbohydrates as much as possible for sure. The others that are linked in people to higher incidences of cancer, are fried food. Generally we're not feeding fried food to animals. Um, red meat is linked to cancer. However, in the literature, I have never found a paper, they could exist, I might just never have been able to find it, that separates out pasture-raised organic beef from corn-fed factory farmed beef. Right. Probably all the links to red meat is likely related to the amount of omega-6 fatty acids and how pro-inflammatory that food is. Yep. Um, because that's the same thing that happens with fry food. It's all pro-inflammatory. So red meat, more than a pound a week is linked to increased risks of prostate, colon, breast cancer in people. However, question mark about the quality of the red meat. Um, you, um, let's see, what else are we avoiding? We talked about the trans fats. So that's the other one that is a huge problem for humans. Um, fried food, red meat, trans fats. And really when it comes to what we're avoiding is over feeding. So the only one thing that's linked to longevity in dogs, there's more in people is them being under in that longevity study is them being underweight. And Judy, you probably have come across this in your Chinese medicine um, theories. It was very interesting because I was doing a presentation with a board certified nutritionist and we were talking about nutrition and cancer patients. And she was talking about the study where feeding about 75% of what their nutritional requirement would be. So they were just underweight was linked to longevity. And then I, about two minutes later presented a traditional Chinese medicine theory about where you only eat until you're three fourths full and that that was linked to longevity of life. So it was actually very interesting because they coincided with one another. Um, and so it's actually about not overfeeding and keeping them lean. So it's not just what you're feeding, but that you're not feeding too much of it. True. True. Mm -hmm. So going on that vein of keeping their weight very moderate and not allowing them to be overweight or obese, which is... Yep let me tell you that is an epidemic in this country for Absolutely. people as well as animals, um, animals yep. I, I think the last stats i saw said something like 54 percent of dogs and cats in america are overweight it's probably more there's no way it's only 54 percent yeah there's it's no probably way. more i mean i guess if if we're saying um you know overweight versus obese because i think what most of us consider a healthy weight is actually overweight. Yes. Um, yes. So that's part of the problem. We don't, yes. we don't have a good handle on what a healthy weight is when we yes. are looking at our pets. Like I look at my cats, I've got one that is on the very thin side. She'll probably live forever. And she's a pain in my butt. Uh, <laughs> then I've got one who's a pretty normal cat. And then I've got one, he's blubber boy and he's the first one to the food. I, in our cat condo, they've got this little eight inch hole to get through. And every day I'm like, is your belly going to fit through there? But, you know, they, he's the first one to the food bowl and he eats more than everybody else. And that's just the way it is. Okay. Um, I, I would have to re restrict him somehow. And I'm not quite sure how to do that with multiple kitties. But um, so uh, so definitely keeping them lean. But that also is going to include getting them moving, keeping yes. them moving. Yes. Um, you know, and I think that's something, especially with those of us who are working all the time, sitting at our computer all day, it's bad for us to sit all day. Um, I saw something the other day uh, where you should set a timer every 30 minutes to go off every 30 minutes, get up from your computer, go 
walk, walk through the building, walk outside. And frankly, if we would do that for ourselves and take our pets with us every time we did it, <laughs> it would be healthy for both of us. Absolutely. And, um, you know, <clears throat> there's so many theories and support about cancer being, um, metabolic mitochondrial disease, not a genetic disease. And what the mitochondria needs to be healthy is oxygen. And the only way that you get oxygen to the mitochondria is with exercising. Um, there are things like ozone that also does that, you know, so ozone may play ozone, medical ozone, um, may play a part in some cancer prevention, but that's because it would be keeping mitochondria healthy. So absolutely a thousand percent activity is for sure. in people linked to cancer prevention and decreased risk, risk of cancer and cardiovascular disease. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. So, uh, and particularly if you have, so we, I talked a lot of this week about stress and chi stagnation and blood stagnation. So movement helps with all of that. And certainly for those breeds of dogs that are supposed to be working dogs, um, mm -hmm. and, and frankly, our cats too, it's the nature of cats to hunt. To, yeah. to be on the hunt, to, to be stalking, to be prowling. I watch our barn cats who are just picture of activity. They're always, you know, playing with strings or hay nets or pieces of hay or chasing mice. And it's like they're, they're just busy versus the indoor cats who are like, oh, here's my cat tree. Oh, here's the sofa. I mean, that's literally, they move from the sofa to the chair to yeah. the sunny spot. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. No. And if you think about, you know, it, for us as people in our lifetime right now, um, the thought of what it was like a hundred years ago before the industrial revolution and refrigerated cars that could move meat. And then the change of the pet food industry completely for them to be getting these commercial available products. It really hasn't been that long from a, you know, evolution standpoint, it's only been like a hundred years. And so if you think about the evolution of cats and the evolution of dogs, their body and their genes, just like us, have not had time to adapt to how much has changed in a hundred years. And so their bodies are not used to exactly what you're saying, sitting around all the time, sedentary lifestyles, obesity, high carb diets, high processed diets, lack of sunshine, lack of clean air, um, food that's reduced all its nutrients, not providing us what we need. So there's unfortunately like an assault on all of us, which I think is no shock about why there's been skyrocketing amounts of chronic disease and cancer on both humans and animals. Have you seen any studies that would show, uh, and, and maybe we don't have good statistics from a hundred years ago, but I would be really interested to know, like what was the percentage of dogs or cats that were diagnosed with cancer in their lifetime or died because we have pretty good statistics now and, and they're shockingly scary statistics that over half of dogs over age 10 will die from cancer that's horrible and that is like 20 years old judy it's so old <laughs> it's, it's so, so it's old. probably much worse now but yeah. it would be really interesting to see statistics like every decade you know mm -hmm. going back to kind of before the industrial revolution like every decade this is our and you know, a hundred years ago, we weren't so worried about, we were, you know, fighting world wars. We weren't really so concerned about uh, what the statistics for cancer were in our pets. And I think veterinary medicine was kind of, you know, very minimal. Um, particularly, I, it was more farm animal and a lot less on the, the pet side, but it would be really interesting to to I compare. And you know, the other, the other resource that would be really interesting that I haven't come across, um, but I'll keep, uh, you know, an eye out for it. If it, I ever see it, you know, a lot of the European countries haven't industrialized as much. There's still a lot of traditional cultures that still have their own farms and go to farmers markets. And, you know, it's not as industrialized as it is here. And so, and a lot of them keep their animals the same way. And I, I wonder too, if, you know, if I could ever come across data about that, but I haven't seen any. Um, and it, it has to be significantly impacting all of it. 